The Nine Lives of Ski Mask Life 5 Medusa Chapter 1 Madeline Ski Mask runs down the north wing corridor to his bedroom. Madeline is sprawled out on the floor. Max is lying next to her, using one of her arms as a pillow. She tries to lift her head, but is unsuccessful. Instead, she just whimpers and manages to wag her thick tail. Ski Mask rushes to her side and lifts up her head. He looks into her foggy eyes and rubs her snout. My poor baby. She stares at him and whimpers again. I'm here. It's gonna be okay. He rubs her head and gives her a kiss on the nose, causing her tail wagging to increase. Do something for her! Do something for her! He looks back at Claire and sees a tear rolling down her cheek as she shakes her head. I'm sorry. I've done everything I can. He looks back at Madeline. The life in her eyes appears to be flickering on and off. No. No! This isn't happening. Not today. He wraps his arms around her mammoth body and looks up at Claire. Help me pick her up. A constant cloud of dust lingers behind Ski Mask's truck as he flies down the gravel road. He looks over his shoulder at Claire in the back seat, who is cradling Madeline and stroking her head. How's she doing? Claire is remaining strong, but can't conceal the concern from her expression. The same. Ski Mask presses the accelerator to the floor. Chapter 2 Jack Frost Ski Mask pulls up to the Madisonville Psychiatric Hospital and is surprised to see the buzz of activity. A cluster of news vehicles have clogged the entire front circular driveway. Swarms of media members congest the main entrance. Several police officers and security guards are attempting to maintain some kind of order, but are largely unsuccessful. What is going on? Ski Mask takes a scan of the area and then looks back at Claire. Wait here. Ski Mask bolts from the car. He quickly assesses that he has no chance to enter through the overrun main entrance and ducks around the building to a small side entrance. Several media members are trying to enter through there as well. Ski Mask shoves his way through the mass of people, hurling several of them to the ground and in no time reaches the security guard who is manning the door. Where's Dr. Grimm's office? I'm sorry, this is employee entry only. You have to go around to the main entrance. They'll help you there. Ski Mask smashes his forearm into the security guard's throat and pins him against the wall as he snaps open a knife and holds it inches from the guard's face. Where is Dr. Grimm's office? The security guard pants and speaks quickly. Uh, fourth floor, room 438. Ski Mask removes the walkie-talkie and the gun from the guard's belt. He slams the walkie to the ground, shattering it in pieces, and roughly pushes the guard aside before disappearing into a nearby stairwell. The stairwell is busy. Several different hospital personnel rush back and forth, including some security guards who rush past him, not even giving him a second glance. Either they are completely frazzled by the magnitude of the clearly unexpected chaos, or they are simply inept. Likely both. Obviously something major has happened, but Ski Mask doesn't care what it is as long as he can find Franklin Grimm. He reaches the fourth floor and is faced with a large, authorized personnel only sign. He tries the door, but it's locked. Luckily for him, some random person in a lab coat hustles through the door past him. Ski Mask catches the door before it closes and enters the fourth floor. He notices a security station next to the entrance, but it's unmanned. Ski Mask shakes his head at the incompetence he's witnessed in the few minutes he's been here. Ski Mask marches down the hectic corridor past a variety of people. He sees a thin, red-headed man in scrubs calling out to Dr. Lewis as he runs down the hall. He stops at a woman in her 40s with short brown hair wearing a doctor's jacket and holding a clipboard. Dr. Lewis, have you seen Dr. Grimm? She shakes her head. No, his office door is locked. I don't know where he is. The redhead panics. 
The hospital is about to be overrun by the press. He has to make some kind of statement. Things are out of control. Ski Mask hurries past them and is troubled by how many other people he overhears asking about Dr. Grimm's whereabouts. Time is of the essence. He needs to find Dr. Grimm. Ski Mask takes notice of the doctor walking toward him who stands out from the crowd. He's a burly man with white hair and a thick white mustache. While most everyone else is anxious, this man holds a smirk on his face and appears subtly cheerful. Ski Mask looks down at the doctor's name tag that reads Dr. Clark. He can overhear Dr. Clark speaking to a colleague. He speaks in a near gleeful tone. This could ruin him. Dr. Clark is not watching where he is going and his shoulder bumps Ski Mask. He barks at Ski Mask in a testy manner. Watch where you are going. Dr. Clark looks at Ski Mask with disgust as if he were some kind of lowly peon before continuing on with his colleague. Ski Mask files the name in the back of his mind and continues to Dr. Grimm's office. The chatter he overheard is confirmed. Dr. Grimm's office is indeed locked. He can hear the phone continuously ringing behind the door. He bangs on the door, but there is no reply. He pounds on it again, but there is no response. Grimm, open this damn door right now. Ski Mask steps back and gives the door a kick, and another, and another. The door finally swings open. Dr. Grimm's secretary, Gloria, cowers behind her desk as Ski Mask bursts into the secretary's portion of Dr. Grimm's office. Where is he? Gloria, who is making no attempt to answer the phone that is ringing off the hook in front of her, takes in a breath and speaks calmly. He's not in. Ski Mask approaches the attached office door to the right of the room and turns the knob, which is locked. He's not in. If you leave your name, I'll have him contact you as soon as he's able. Ski Mask turns and glares at Gloria. He speaks slow and distinctly. Buzz. Me. In. The haunting look Gloria is receiving conveys the fact that if she doesn't do as requested, this could very well be the final day of her life. She can't hit the buzzer fast enough. Ski Mask enters Dr. Grimm's office and slams the door behind him. Dr. Grimm, who is sitting behind his desk, staring out the window at the growing mass of unwanted humanity, startles and spins around. Ski Mask! What the hell is going on around here? Why are you locked in your office? You haven't heard? Heard what? About the escape. The serial killer Jack Winters, better known as Jack Frost. He escaped today. I'm not surprised. Your security here is a joke. Dr. Grimm looks out the window at the onslaught of reporters. These vultures want my scalp. Forget about that. I need your help. It's Madeline. Madeline? My St. Bernard. She's dying. I want you to give her a lifeline. Dr. Grimm looks at Ski Mask as if this request is preposterous. Are you out of your mind? If you haven't noticed, this isn't the greatest time for me. Ski Mask walks in a deliberate fashion behind the desk. Dr. Grimm rolls his chair backwards away from Ski Mask until he halts at the wall. Ski Mask moves his face closer to Franklin. This is not a request. Dr. Grimm holds his hands up. Okay, okay, I'll help. I'll bring her up. Well, I don't have the equipment here. Everything's at the lab. I, I don't know when I'll be able to get out there again. Now. We are going there right now. Dr. Grimm stands and begins to pace back and forth as he rambles. No, I, I, I can't. They'll rip me apart. Don't you understand? A notorious serial killer escaped from my institution. I could lose my job. Franklin, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. We are leaving now. Dr. Grimm's mind is elsewhere. This job means everything to me. Ski Mask grabs him by the jacket and presses him against the wall. You're not going to have a life, let alone a job, if you don't come with me right now. Okay, okay. Ski Mask lets him go. Dr. Grimm looks flustered. What am I going to do? How am I going to get out of here? His eyes begin darting around the room as he calculates his next move. Suddenly, he rockets toward the door. I'll meet you at the lab. Dr. Grimm sprints out of his office past his secretary who calls for him, but he doesn't slow down. Ski Mask moves to the secretary's door, peers down the corridor, and observes Dr. Grimm running past his subordinates. Many who are calling out to him are stating, there he is. Ski Mask watches as a panicked Dr. Grimm exits the floor via the stairwell. Ski Mask shakes his head. Fool.
Chapter 3 Conflict Dr. Grimm helped Ski Mask and Claire set Madeline on a steel gurney inside the Grimm's lab. Her breathing has become extremely labored and her eyes have glassed over. Dr. Grimm listens to her heart with a stethoscope. Her heartbeat is extremely weak. He takes the stethoscope out of his ears and looks solemnly at Ski Mask. I'm afraid she won't last much longer. Ski Mask grabs Dr. Grimm by the coat. Do something! Claire attempts to pull him back. Calm down. Help her! She has to pass first. And then I'll bring her back. Ski Mask takes in a few breaths and releases his grip on Dr. Grimm. Claire rubs Ski Mask's back and consoles him as he looks mournfully at Madeline. Her eyes have closed now and her breathing is deep and slow. Ski Mask whispers to Madeline. It's gonna be okay, baby. We'll make you feel all better. Madeline lets out a slow, wheezing breath and doesn't take one back in. Madeline? She is no longer breathing. No. Dr. Grimm listens to her heart with the stethoscope, looks at Ski Mask, and shakes his head. Ski Mask drops his head down onto Madeline's body. My baby. My sweet baby. He looks up at Franklin. Fix her. Dr. Grimm takes out his revival device. He presses a button and the tip glows red. Ski Mask opens Madeline's eyes with his fingers and speaks to her. I'm right here, Madeline. Claire watches on with bated breath as Dr. Grimm places the tip of the device to the base of Madeline's skull. I'm right here. Claire grips onto Ski Mask's forearm as she watches. Madeline doesn't move. She shows no signs of life. Her lungs are still, her mouth is open, and her tongue lies lifelessly on the cold metal of the gurney. Ski Mask begins to panic, looking back and forth rapidly between Claire and Dr. Grimm. What's wrong? Why isn't anything happening? A cough stops Ski Mask in mid-sentence. At first, he thought it was Dr. Grimm, but Dr. Grimm is looking at Madeline and smiling. Another cough, and another, followed by Madeline quickly rolling from her side to her belly and lifting her big fat head up. She looks around the room and her eyes fill with enthusiasm when she sees Ski Mask. She jumps down off the gurney with the ease of a jaguar. She looks at Ski Mask and lets out several playful barks. Her tail is a blur from the speed of her wagging. She lowers the front of her body while keeping her haunches up in the air and lets out a playful growl before launching forward and running around the lab like a puppy. She grabs a box of latex gloves off the shelf and shakes them like a rag. She barks again and runs to Ski Mask who bends down and closes his eyes as he hugs her tight. She responds by nearly licking his face off and then prances to Claire, who loves on her as well. Ski Mask, still kneeling, places his hands over his face. After a moment, he drops his hands and looks up at Dr. Grimm. He stares at him briefly and then propels forward toward him. Dr. Grimm backpedals but cannot escape the massive bear hug Ski Mask lays on him. Dr. Grimm is shocked, and looks as such during the duration of the hug. Ski Mask then places his hands on each side of Dr. Grimm's face and plants a big smacking kiss on his cheek. He looks him directly in the eyes and speaks firmly. Thank you. Uh, Yeah, you're you're welcome. Now I want you to implant her with an auto-regenerating chip. What? These aren't Tic Tacs that you can just toss around willy-nilly. These are sophisticated pieces of hardware. I don't think you realize the amount of time it takes to complete one of these. He stops when he sees the seriousness of Ski Mask's expression. But this isn't a request, is it? Ski Mask shakes his head. Okay, but you owe me. Ski Mask nods and Dr. Grimm collapses into a chair. Now that this ordeal has been dealt with, his mind refloods with the escape. He drops his head into his hands and shakes his head as he speaks. I'm ruined. Ski Mask looks back at Madeline, who is getting her belly rubbed while being baby-talked from Claire. He pulls up a chair next to Franklin. What happened? Jack Winters escaped. Have you heard of him? I remember something about him. A Jack the Ripper type, right? Killed a bunch of whores? Uh, Right. Ski Mask shakes his head with disgust. Pathetic. Mommy issues. (laughs) That's putting it mildly. How do you escape? Well, somehow, someone screwed up the paperwork and security let him out as part of a field trip group. Once off the grounds, it was easy pickings for him. 
Nobody dangerous was supposed to be with that group. They were supposed to spend the morning at a park. Security was light. He killed the guards, the doctor, the other patients, and waltzed away. Who made the escape public? Well, I did. I was hoping he could find him before he got far. And that was your first mistake. You should have called me. I could have tracked him down, subdued him, and brought him back. Nobody would have known a thing. You'd still catch some heat for your field trip group getting slaughtered, but it wouldn't be to the extent you're feeling right now. Hell, if I had enough time, I could have made it look like the group was killed in a crash. <laughs> what? what? Really? You think you could have done all that? Ski Mask grins. Piece of cake. Who's your head of security? Uh, well, his name is Stan Walters. He's a bungling twit. Just inherited a bunch of land and is always going on about wanting to start some kind of hiking company. His head is always in the clouds. I, I should have fired him years ago. Perfect. He'll be your scapegoat. Get rid of him. Deflect most of the responsibility onto him and weather the storm. It may be rough for you in the short run, but eventually this will blow over. Dr. Grimm's mind drips off. As the plan Ski Mask laid out for him begins to make sense, he starts to nod. Uh, yes. Yes, I, I, I think you're right. I think I may be able to survive this, but who will I get as my new head of security? Ski Mask holds his arms out and winks. I owe you, right? A sense of relief washes over Franklin's face. Alfred quickly enters the lab. Uh, Franklin, I just heard about the escape. Are you okay? Franklin nods and smiles. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm going to be just fine. Is there anything I can do? Thank you, but... I have it all under control. Alfred turns to Ski Mask. I'm glad you're here. Your requirement that we no longer use animals for experimentation has our development at a standstill. We must continue our work. In addition to that, I have many questions for you about your experience with the autoresponder chip so that we can continue to make progress. Alfred, I am the answer to all your problems. Come back to my place with us. I'll show you what I mean. Alfred seems encouraged and nods. All right, let me have a few words with Franklin. I'll be out your way shortly. Ski Mask looks to Franklin. Tell him how to get there. As Franklin takes Alfred's phone and enters the coordinates, Ski Mask opens the door to the lab. Come on, girl. Madeline friskily runs out the door, followed by Ski Mask and Claire. After the door shuts, Alfred turns to Franklin. You look better than I was expecting. Franklin points to the door Ski Mask just walked through. That guy is something else. He is quite the specimen indeed. Alfred studies Franklin for a moment. I must say, I was expecting you to be more unhinged than you are. <laughs> Disappointed? Alfred is offended. How dare you? Of course not. I'm pleasantly surprised at how well you seem to be holding up. Well, it's, it's an unfortunate situation, but I'll get through it and come out on the other side a wiser man. Alfred nods. That's quite the admirable attitude. He pats Franklin on the arm. I'm proud of you. Franklin rolls his eyes. But, but, you don't need to be working in that stressful environment. This project we are immersed in will change the world. It will change our lives as we know it. It will change everyone's lives. And quite frankly, it's a lot more important than overseeing the wasted lives at that madhouse you spend most of your existence at. I love what I do. Why can't you understand that? You only see what you want to see, but you never bother trying to see things from my perspective. I'm in charge there. I run the game. Everybody looks up to me. I'm respected. I'm revered. You want to be godlike? What could be more godlike than giving back life? And who will be more revered than those who created this possibility? When you ran that hospital and I was rising up the ranks, I was never given the respect I deserved. Even though I worked my ass off and earned everything I ever got there, it was always assumed that Daddy was giving me a leg up the entire time. When you retired and I took over, that all changed. Sure, most thought I got the job because of whose son I was, but what no one could deny is that I turned that place around on my own after you left. And that was me. It was all me. That hospital is me. Everything that is accomplished there is because of me, not you, and not because I'm your son. I'm tired of living in your shadow. Have you lost your mind, Franklin? Have you gone mad? Don't you realize this is the same situation? Yes, I may have invented this technology, but I don't have many years left. 
<laughs> Don't have many years left? Are you serious? We both know that as soon as you study ski mass further and determine that it's absolutely safe to do so, you will implant yourself with the lifeline and I'll be living in your shadow for the rest of my life. No, Franklin. I'll make sure that we are equal partners and that we get equal credit. I'll even give you more credit. More than I deserve? That's not what I meant. <laughs> but it's true. This is your invention. I'm just some damn sidekick. I'm your Igor. Franklin. No, I'm through talking about this altogether. Alfred lets out a defeated breath. We'll revisit this discussion when you're in a more stable state of mind. He stares at his son for a moment, turns, and exits the lab. Chapter 4 Something New When they open the door to the house, Madeline bolts in and starts running around the main room in circles, burning off some of the energy that she hasn't experienced in years. When she finally slows down, the other dogs all encircle her and sniff at her. Slick and Trip are both beamed in the head multiple times by Madeline's hefty wagging tail. Max begins jumping joyously as he tries to lick Madeline's snout. During the excitement, Floppy and Dempsey begin wrestling with each other, and this continues as they run down the north wing toward the bedrooms. After thoroughly inspecting Madeline, Snowman lies down and rests while viewing the surrounding excitement. Schemas looks at Claire, who is smiling and occasionally laughing while she watches the dogs. She has no idea how close Schemask is to looking at her soft skin, her lips, her eyes. When she finally realizes he is looking at her and turns her head, Schemas quickly moves his eyes as if he were caught doing something he shouldn't have been. This makes Claire smile. I never got to ask you how your trip went. It was successful. Claire smirks as she sarcastically asks the next question. Did you die again? Yes. Claire's eyes widen. I was kidding. Did you really? Yep. What happened? Ski Mask is visibly apprehensive to divulge specifics, and Claire recognizes this. It's okay, you don't have to tell me. Claire grins and ponders a moment. You know, you're kind of like a superhero. That's bullshit. Your language! Sorry. Bull... crud. I'm no hero. She gazes at Madeline, who is now cuddled on the floor with Max. You were today. Claire and Ski Mask look at each other. Friendly casual at first, and then their eyes lock. Neither would admit that the look is anything other than innocent, but their eyes betray them, as does the length of their stare. The loud beep of an alarm breaks their focus, and Ski Mask glances at the security monitors. It's Alfred. He looks to Claire. Buzz him in, will ya? Claire goes to the intercom panel and gives Alfred the instructions on how to enter. Ski Mask looks down the west wing and then back at Claire. After Alfred leaves, if you want to sit with me and the birds, I'll tell you what happened on my trip. If you'd like to know. Claire is overjoyed. I do. I'd really like that. Alfred knocks on the door. Slick immediately runs to Claire's side as she opens it. The other dogs look up attentively, waiting to see if Slick will need any assistance. Sorry for the delay. Scarface and Darkness trot to Alfred, sniff at his ankles, and then aggressively begin rubbing their heads and bodies against his calves. Oh, cats. I'm not a big fan of... Claire quickly shakes her head and motions back to Ski Mask. Alfred catches her drift. Hello there, kitties. He looks at Slick, who is sizing him up. Hello, puppy. Alfred pats Slick on the head and looks up at the main room of Ski Mask's dwelling. My god, Ski Mask, this place is incredible. I think you'll be even more impressed by the East Wing. Come on. Ski Mask motions Alfred to the East Wing and they walk down the corridor to the door. Before punching in the code to open the door, Ski Mask looks back at the empty corridor behind him. Wait here, I'll be right back. Ski Mask walks to the end of the corridor to the main room to find Claire staring at the corridor. He walks closer to her. Do you want to come with us? Claire's eyes widen and she doesn't hesitate to answer. Yes. Ski Mask waves her on. 
When they reach the end of the East Wing corridor, Ski Mask punches in the code to the door and they follow him down to the stone stairs. Ski Mask stops at the accordion folding gate. He flips a fake stone on the wall that reveals another keypad. Before entering the code, he addresses Alfred and Claire. You have to enter the code to open this gate. He looks directly at Claire. If for some unlikely reason this gate is unlocked, you still have to enter the code. If anyone passes beyond this gate without entering the code, booby traps are activated throughout the entire East Wing. Is that clear? Alfred and Claire both nod, and Ski Mask enters the code which automatically folds the gate to the side. Welcome to the East Wing. Ski Mask guides them through a myriad of twists and turns, leading them down one passage to another before finally stepping into a large room. Alfred is overwhelmed by the size of it. My God! The room is provided with a variety of counters, cabinets, and shelving units. There are four prong industrial electrical outlets every four feet. There are multiple sinks and affixed island tables. Fluorescent lights line the ceilings, but there are also several large dome exam crane lights that can be pulled down and adjusted to one's preference. Eight small jail cells make up one entire wall. Each cell is furnished with cots, toilets, and the walls are equipped with various restraints. Ski Mask leads them to a room off the back of the lab. He opens the door and flicks on the lights, revealing a cozy, furnished one-bedroom apartment. Alfred walks through the apartment. He then wanders back out into the lab and starts turning around, taking it all in. It's perfect. Absolutely perfect. This is your new lab. Alfred turns to Ski Mask. His mouth is agape. I really don't know what to say. Thank you. Ski Mask nods. I'll be much more productive in this setting. He takes in a breath. Unfortunately, I'll be slowed by the increasing absence of my son. That damn hospital continues to soak up all of his time. Claire steps forward. First of all, watch your language in this place. Secondly, I can help. She may have spoken too soon and looks to Ski Mask to interpret his reaction. He appears neutral, which is probably a good sign. I mean, the animals keep me busy, but when Ski Mask is home, I have a lot of time on my hands and I'm curious to learn more about all of this. Alfred studies her for a moment and slowly nods. I think you can be of great assistance to me. Groovy! Ski Mask speaks as he walks toward the door. Claire follows him. We'll leave you to get a better feel for the place and let your wheels spin as to how to best utilize it. If you ever need me or Claire, there are intercoms by the main doors of every room. Alfred nods as he almost giddily wanders through his new lab. Ski Mask and Claire exit and walk a considerable distance down one of the passageways before either of them speak. I have to ask, the cells, the booby traps, the freezer, the bodies, this whole underground fortress? Don't ask questions you don't want to know the answers to. But I want the answers. They exit the passage into a large corridor that Ski Mask would refer to as the main corridor. Maybe I can assist you in other ways other than just helping to take care of the gang. Ski Mask shakes his head. You have no idea what you'd be getting into. Claire stops, and in turn, Ski Mask stops and faces her. I can handle it. Ski Mask studies her face. She is serious, but this is a big step. Something he's never even considered. An assistant? Before he can say anything, his phone rings. He holds up his finger to Claire as he answers it. Even though the phone is pressed against Ski Mask's ear, Claire can still make out the frantic voice of Dr. Franklin Grimm. Ski Mask, I need your help! What is it? There's been another escape! Two escapes in one day? You have to be kidding. No, I'm not! Something is wrong out there. You're goddamn right something is wrong, and I'll tell you exactly what it is. My head of security is a mental midget. He is the definition of ineptitude. Will you calm down? Who else knows about this? Nobody. Nobody. I did just like you said. I called as soon as I discovered the escape. Good boy. I'll get in touch with my people, and we'll find your escapee. What's their name?
Chapter 5 Medusa Ski Mask and Claire stand in Tamale Jones' office. She goes by the moniker of Medusa. One reason, because of this skirt's hairdo. It's one of those dreadlock get-ups. The way she fashions it makes it come across as a head of snakes. Two, because she has a fascination with, you guessed it, snakes. They say one of the scale's turn-ons is to get the old heave-ho while covered in poisonous snakes. Venomous. What's that? You said poisonous. You meant venomous. Ah, uh, there's a difference? Venom is injected directly, such as a snake bite. Poison is a toxin spread via ingesting or merely by touch. Think poison ivy. Okay, so she likes to be covered with venomous snakes when she's having a blanket party. Either way, this is one crazy Jane. Claire lets out a short sign of relief, causing both Ski Mask and Tamale to look at her, obviously wondering why. She recognizes this and explains. I was relieved because I thought you were going to say the B word. You mean bitch? Claire winces at the word. She doesn't like cursing. Uh, my apologies, I'll try to keep that in mind. Well, kudos to you for using Crazy Jane as a creative alternative to swearing. Well done. Tamale looks at her curiously. Who are you? She's with me. Tamale thinks for a moment and then smiles mischievously. Ah, I get it. No, not like that. Tamale studies Claire for a moment and crinkles his brow. You look familiar. Have we met? Claire shakes her head and answers quickly. No. I know I've seen you somewhere before. Ski Mask steers the discussion back to the main topic. Tell me where I can find this Medusa. My sources tell me that she used to frequent a fetish establishment called Club Fun. They have something called the Snake Room, which would be right up her alley. She could be lambing it over there. Thanks, Tamale. Tamale gives Ski Mask and Claire a tip of his fedora, and they exit. Chapter 6 Club Fun The building appears to be an old abandoned school. The once vibrant colors on the outside of the building have been weathered away by time, exposing dirty concrete. The entrance to the building is plain, centered by two gray metal doors with vertical windows. One wouldn't think anything was happening beyond the doors if it weren't for the flashing strobe of light. His instinct is to tell her to wait for him in the car, but he knows she'll be eager to assist and it's possible she may be helpful. Ski Mask reaches into the glove compartment, pulls out a black bandana, and hands it to Claire. Wear this over your face. This is a sex fetish club. Ordinary will stand out. Claire takes in a breath, ties the bandana around her neck, and raises it over her nose. Ski Mask nods and pulls his ski mask down over his head. Let's go. The exclusivity of the club appears to be nil as there is no one manning the door, giving the appearance that anyone can enter at will. Ski Mask and Claire walk down the entrance corridor to a vinyl curtain. They push it aside and enter another corridor. This one is painted with pastel blue, yellow, and pink stripes. Ahead of them they see a woman in a black dress and a beehive style wig, pulling a man in a purple shirt and leather pants past a corridor and around a corner. Ski Mask stops and peers down the corridor to their right. This one is colored light gray. The lighting in the hall casts a slight blue hue over everything. Halfway down the corridor is a short flight of five stairs. The corridor continues beyond that. Ski Mask waves for Claire to stay back as he spies on the events unfolding before him. A nerdy man with a comb-over, Buddy Holly-style glasses, and an oversized shirt runs in a panic towards Ski Mask as a muscular-built bald man wearing a sheer mesh t-shirt gives chase. The muscular man's hands are balled into fists and a serious expression covers his face. The nerd quickly ducks into a room just before reaching the corridor. The mesh t-shirt man follows him in and shuts the door behind him. Ski Mask looks back at Claire and nods and then steps forward into the corridor. The only person he currently sees occupying the space is a large man in an orange shirt with black pants. He's standing at the top of the short flight of stairs. As Ski Mask and Claire move down the corridor closer to the man, they see his face is painted white and his lips black. 
He is stroking his cheap black Halloween fright wig that flows down to his shoulders. Ski Mask steps up to the white-faced man and looks directly at him. Where is the snake room? The white-faced man stares off in a daze. My name is Ernest. Okay, Ernest, where is the snake room? My name is Ernest. Ski Mask and Claire look at each other. She shrugs and Ski Mask tries again. Tell me where the snake room is. My name is Ernest. Ski Mask can see that Ernest's eyes are glazed over. He's obviously on some kind of drug. His gaze isn't even focused on Ski Mask, but rather in the room behind him. Ski Mask turns to see what Ernest is so fixated on. Inside the room, a group of well-dressed men and women are masturbating enthusiastically as they watch a man in a skin-tight latex outfit with a zipper mouth hood. He is accompanied by a woman with a white shirt, bow tie, fishnet stockings, and a clear plastic face mask. They are both doing some strange form of interpretive dance next to a bound woman wearing a short black skirt and a Ouija board top. When Claire peeks in, she gasps and quickly turns away. Ski Mask looks back at Ernest and realizes he's more so talking to himself as he continues to say, I am Ernest, over and over. Ski Mask and Claire both turn their heads when they hear a door open back near the corridor entrance. The mesh t-shirted man steps out of the room he had chased the nerd into. He appears to be dejected as he hangs his head and walks toward them. When he notices them watching him, he stands erect and grimaces. What the hell are you looking at? Ski Mask gives Claire a hand signal to stay where she is as he approaches the mesh shirt man. He steps in front of him and they have a short stare down before the mesh shirt man speaks. What's your problem, asshole? The mesh shirt man reaches out to shove Ski Mask, but Ski Mask intercepts this move by grabbing the mesh shirt man's hand and spinning it, forcing the mesh shirt man to roll with the turn to keep his wrist from snapping. As he twists, the mesh shirt man exposes his back to Ski Mask, allowing Ski Mask to shove him forward and press his face against the cold painted cinder block wall. Ski Mask bangs the mesh shirt man's head into the wall a couple of times while continuing to hold the wrist lock and then moves his mouth close to the mesh shirt man's ear and whispers sharply, Where's the snake room? The mesh shirt man, wincing in pain, points toward the entrance corridor with his free hand. Go around the corner. Keep following the hall. You'll, you'll know it when you see it. Ugh. Ski Mask pushes the mesh shirt man's head against the hard cinder block wall one more time before releasing him. Ski Mask takes a step back, waiting to see if Mr. Mesh Shirt wants to try anything else. Clearly, the defeated man wants no more. He stands looking down at the floor submissively. Ski Mask and Claire walk away in the direction of the snake room. Once Ski Mask is gone, the Mesh Shirt Man turns around, leans back against the cold wall, and lets out a breath. Oh, that was nice. Ski Mask and Claire turn down a dark corridor. Portions of the hall have splashes of fantastic blue lighting. Other portions are completely black. Ski Mask can feel Claire latch onto the back of his shirt to ensure that he doesn't get too far ahead of her. Figures can be seen periodically in the shadows of the corridor, but Ski Mask doesn't pay them any mind. He keeps motoring along until the corridor empties into a thinner, unusual hallway. The hall they now find themselves standing in is fashioned with at least a dozen toilets. To their left is the end of the hall. In order to continue on, they are required to pass every single toilet. There is no shortcut. Two people occupy toilets immediately in front of them and Ski Mask recognizes them as the first people he encountered in Club Fun. The beehive hairdo woman and the man in the purple shirt. The beehive woman is sitting on one of the toilets with her panties around her ankles. The purple shirt man is sitting next to her. He's fully clothed and holds a bottle of water in her mouth, forcing her to drink it while encouraging her to urinate. Yeah, come on. Piss for daddy. I want to hear that hot piss pounding against that porcelain. Claire gasps. Oh my word. The beehive woman's eyes latch onto Claire as a heavy stream of urine hitting the toilet water can be heard. She continues chugging water and appears to smile, undoubtedly enjoying the audience. The only other person they encounter in the hall of toilets is a man sitting on the last toilet reading a book. 
As they pass him, the smell indicates that he is indeed defecating as he reads. The bandana over her face is not enough to defend her from the offensive odor, so Claire covers her nose with one hand while holding up her other hand to shield her from having to view the defecating man. As they enter the twist of a new corridor, Ski Mask picks up the pace until he finally sees several doors, but they are all identical plain gray doors. Nothing to indicate what type of rooms they are. Ski Mask stops at one of the rooms and puts his ear to the door. He can hear someone moaning within, so he opens it. The room is glowing with dim yellow lighting. In the center of the room is a man wearing a skimpy women's fall leather bikini lingerie. He is holding his arms out to the side as a completely naked man and woman pour vegetable oil on his body and then rub him down with sponges. The naked man and woman are both gingers and their lack of clothing confirm that they are in fact true redheads. The man in the leather bikini has a full head of white hair and a thick white mustache. He looks familiar to Ski Mask and then it dawns on him. It's that asshole Dr. Clark who bumped into him earlier at the Madisonville Psychiatric Hospital. Dr. Clark's annoyance with the interruption is evident in his voice. Do you mind? I'm getting oiled. Ski Mask steps back out of the room and shuts the door. That fruit in the mesh shirt said we know it when we saw it, but these all look the same to me. Claire shrugs and notices a man walking toward them. He's wearing a blue shirt and sunglasses. His ball cap doesn't hide his out-of-style curly mullet. He looks kind of normal. Ask him. Ski Mask stops the man. Where's the snake room? Mullet Man stares at Ski Mask for a moment and then breaks into mime artistry. First, he acts as if he's trapped in an invisible box and then performs as though he's pulling an invisible rope. Ski Mask's patience boils over and he grabs Mullet Man by the throat. I hate mimes! Now where is the fu- He stops mid-word when he hears Claire clear her throat in objection. He gives Claire a sharp look and then continues with Mullet Man, absent the obscenities. Where is the snake room? Upon hearing a voice at his side, Ski Mask turns his head to see a man flanked by a woman. The couple is out of place in this environment, sporting business casual attire. The woman is wearing glasses and her hair is tied back in a ponytail. The man is wearing khakis with a short sleeve collared shirt. His beard is neatly trimmed. He has a folded backgammon set tucked under his arm. He speaks to Ski Mask. Are you looking for the snake room? Ski Mask shoves Mullet Man to the side and nods. These two look the most normal of all, which probably means they're the weirdest of the bunch. The backgammon woman smiles and then turns to a door at their side, points, and lets out a loud hiss. Ski Mask and Claire step closer to the singled out door. At first it looks like all the other rooms in the corridor, but as they get closer, they see the difference smeared in blood across the front of the door. Ten letter S's in a row, indicating the hiss of a snake. Chapter 7 Snake Woman Ski Mask puts his ear to the door and attempts to gauge what might be behind it, but the thudding cacophony of gothic music is too dominant. Ski Mask pulls Claire close to him. I don't know what's in there. When we get inside, stick close to the wall. Try to stay hidden in the shadows until I tell you to do something. Understand? Yes. Ski Mask nods. Here we go. Ski Mask opens the door and they quickly step inside of the room. The gothic music is deafening. The thudding beat reverberates through the room and vibrates their bodies. The room is darkened with the exception of the short flight of four stairs and the large pedestal it leads to which are lit by a purple spotlight. Atop the pedestal, they see Medusa. She is naked, her skin covered in green body paint. Her dreadlock, snake-like hair has been dyed bright orange. She appears to be wearing novelty contacts that have made her eyes solid red. Medusa is on her hands and knees and is being penetrated roughly from behind by a brawny man who is naked save what appears to be a cobra mask. Ski Mask can make out the glistening movement of snakes slithering over Medusa's back. 
Medusa spots Ski Mask and hisses at him, sticking out her self-mutilated tongue, which has been split in two to resemble that of a snake. She gives Snakehead Man a quick nod, and he withdraws from her, stands, and approaches Ski Mask. As Snakehead draws near, Ski Mask notices that the man is not wearing a mask at all. His face has been tattooed with dark scales, and he appears to have had a body modification where some form of subdermal implant has given him a permanent cobra-like hood around his head. The still erect man bears his modified snake fangs and lunges at Ski Mask, who easily sidesteps the assault, turns, and snaps the Snakehead man's neck. He crumples to the floor like a broken accordion. Ski Mask looks up at Medusa, who now stands, hissing at him. She is holding a long snake over her head. Ski Mask gets a better look at the snakes and lets out a groan. He speaks loudly back to Claire so he can be heard over the thudding music. These are Black Mambas, one of the most venomous snakes in the world. I know. The good news is that they typically flee rather than strike, unless they feel threatened. But if angered, they can be very aggressive. I'll try to make this quick. Ski Mask's plan is to rush Medusa and attempt to knock her out quickly. If all goes as planned, she'll collapse, drop the snake, and it will simply slink away. The main challenge will be navigating the swarm of black mambas slithering around her feet. It's imperative that he not step on any of them, thus angering them. Most are close to her, so he thinks he can avoid them by using his reach. Ski Mask moves quickly to the stairs, but slows once he realizes her plan of action. Medusa holds the 14-foot black mamba out in front of her, harshly slaps the back of the snake's head multiple times, and then hurls the creature at Ski Mask. The throw of the serpent is spot on. She's done this before. Ski Mask attempts to simply brush the snake aside, but it becomes entangled around his arms. As he tries to let the angry snake loose, it strikes. Black Mambas are fast and can strike multiple times in the blink of an eye, as this one does. Successful bites on Ski Mask's neck and his lip are achieved before he can toss the creature aside. Ski Mask continues to move forward, but Medusa has paintbrushed another Black Mamba, infuriating the snake before hurling it at Ski Mask, and then another, and then another. Claire screams as she watches helplessly while Ski Mask attempts to toss the snakes aside before being bitten, but they're too fast and angry and she can see that he is taking a lot of damage. Ski Mask reaches the pedestal, but is significantly slowed by the Black Mamba's neurotoxins. Medusa sidesteps him effortlessly, lowers herself, slithers down the steps, and then launches herself at Claire. Claire tries to retreat, but Medusa is too fast for her. While only being of average size, Medusa still towers over the petite Claire, who is tossed toward the center of the room. Medusa crouches down and hisses at Claire. She then reaches down and picks up a nearby black mamba that is attempting to flee. Ski Mask turns. He finally has thrown aside all of the black mambas, but has taken countless bites. He looks down at his hands, which are swollen and covered in blood and venom. His entire body burns as though he is engulfed in flame. He watches on as Claire scoots back further into the room, attempting to keep her distance from Medusa, but the snake woman moves forward, picking up snakes as she goes, angering them with slaps and then tossing them toward Claire. Enough snakes have been tossed her way to where Claire is now encircled. The snakes, feeling endangered, hiss at Claire, opening their inky black mouths in an aggressive manner. Ski Mask attempts to move forward toward Claire, but his legs won't budge and he collapses. He looks up to see Medusa with angered snakes in both of her hands. She is holding them high on their necks so they can't strike her. They both hiss, ready to attack. Medusa joins them in hissing and prepares to hurl both prepped and furious snakes at Claire. Ski Mask watches on, using his arms to crawl toward Claire, but suddenly, the room begins to spin, and all goes dark. The End The Nine Lives of Ski Mask continues with Life 6, Insane Asylum. Insane Asylum